Okay, welcome everyone to the Ancient Presence podcast. Today we have Bob Schneiker, who's a professional geologist slash geophysicist. He has an, uh, an MS in geophysics and paleomagnetism. He's been in the environmental groundwater consulting industry for more than 40 years and created the industry standard soil contaminant modeling software called Seaview, which is used by regulatory agencies and consultants around the world. He's conducted seminars across America, written and published numerous papers and articles in multiple scientific journals, including Skeptic Magazine, and has given presentations for the Geological Society of America, as well as at multiple universities. Bob has publicly disagreed with Robert Schock and John Anthony West's theory that the erosion and weathering on the Great Sphinx of Giza was caused by thousands of years of rainfall, which would indicate that the Sphinx must have been created in an entirely different geological epoch, perhaps 12,000 years ago or even more. He also disagrees with Randall Carlson's ideas about the large scale flooding in the channeled scablands at the end of the last ice age. And he's here today to discuss these fascinating topics with us. And I'm sure we'll also touch on Gobekli Tepe and a bunch of other sites around the world as well. So before we get into it, I wanna take a quick moment to thank our newest Patreon supporter, Jason. Thank you very much for signing up uh, to support us on Patreon. We really appreciate your support. If any of you guys want to support us on Patreon, the link is down below in the description. And if you want to support us in other ways, feel free to drop us a super thanks here on YouTube. We would really appreciate your help. And finally, if you could all do us a solid and really quickly hit the like button down below, it really helps out our channel and helps you know spread this video to a wider audience. So we'd really appreciate that as well. Thank you very much. So, Bob, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Nice. Yeah, so how about you first uh, tell us a bit about how you got into this topic and some of your background, whatever you want to share about your, you know, your, your studies, your um, education, and how your geological work led you to get interested in the Sphinx and ancient civilizations and how you found Robert Schock's work and all of that? Sure. Well, it was me actually watching Nova on public television. This was, I can't believe this now, it was 11 years ago, and it was an episode where Mark Lehner was explaining how the Sphinx is weathering due to wicking groundwater. So what's happening is the shallow groundwater wicks up at the surface. You can really see it on the southern wall of the Sphinx enclosure. <clears throat> And what happens is, is as the water wicks up, it evaporates in the hot desert sun. And when it evaporates, it evaporates, it leaves salt behind. And the salt crystals build in the pores. And over time, those salt crystals build up pressure and cause the rock to exfoliate. And that's what gives the southern enclosure wall of the Sphinx enclosure that rounded appearance. <clears throat> I knew nothing about any lost civilization or any of that. The reason I was intrigued by that is because I have a software package, as you mentioned, and I do training on that. And part of the process in the training is explaining what happens to groundwater. And everyone understands that rain falls on the ground and it percolates through the ground and it might pick up contamination like a coffee maker and leach that into groundwater. But what can also happen under certain instances, if the water table is shallow enough and it's warm enough, that the water will wick up and evaporate. So I was just going to use the Sphinx as an example of that process, because conceptually it's hard for everyone, including myself, to, to imagine that the water is wicking up and evaporating. And so that was it. And I, I just was going to use it as an example in my training seminars. And that's when I started looking into it. And that's when I came across Robert Schock saying that you know, this, the, the erosion of the Sphinx is proof that it's older, created by a lost civilization. And I was thinking, oh, come on. He's thinking that this wicking water, he, he's, he's messed, up, messed up so much on this that he's thinking the wicking water is the reason that there's a lost civilization. So I did the modeling in my software and I did the research. And I realized, in a sense, he is right because the, the, the wicking water couldn't possibly create the what looks like erosion on higher sections of the Sphinx. So now I'm kind of hooked. I'm kind of like, well, okay. So, and, and I presented a paper on that wicking water. 
Um, and basically, the scenario that I presented, this was in 2014 at the Geological Society of America meeting in Vancouver. And what I said was, is that prior to constructing the Sphinx, prior to quarrying out the Sphinx enclosure, the water table was so low that the water table, the groundwater didn't wick up and it just stayed where it was. When they created the Sphinx enclosure and, and removing those blocks to create the Sphinx and the Valley Temples, when they did, they intersected the water table. And that caused mm. the, the capillary rise zone on the water table, I should say. And that caused the water to start waking up. But the Sphinx has spent most of the past 4,500 years buried in sand. And because it's buried in sand, it's again turned off. That you're not mm. going to get that wicking because you need something more like a weathered limestone or a clay something with fine porosity and the, and the sand is just too coarse to have much of a capillary rise zone. <clears throat> so I realized that that, that doesn't account for what's going on. Do you have a question? Yeah. Capillary rise zone, like essentially if you, if you carve down and excavate into the, into the bedrock, it kind of opens up a place where water that's in the, in the water table deep within the, the earth can then come up and, start the weathering process of uh, the surface level limestone. Exactly. And and it's odd because I always thought, not knowing much about it, I always thought the Sphinx was, you know, on, on the top of some plateau. And so me, one of the big questions was, all right, where's the water coming from? Isn't it on mm. a, a plateau? Well, it turns out that you guys have been there. The Sphinx is in the Nile floodplain. Mm -hmm. It's not at the top. It's down at the bottom. And it's really technically not a plateau. You could call it a coesta, you could call it an anticline, but the Sphinx was actually at the low end. And, and at times, even if today, if the Aswan Dam weren't there, the Sphinx would be in, inundated by the Nile floods on rare occasions. But almost every year, the floods would be high enough to saturate the rock beneath the Sphinx and replenish that water that's wicking up. But like I said, the Sphinx was buried most of the time. So it's now sand free for tourism. And that erosional process has been turned on. In fact, it's been accelerating. And I've got an unpublished paper on why it's accelerating. <clears throat> so you, you, you've been there. So you know that the, the Sphinx is staring at a KFC Pizza Hut. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> it's quite terrible, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just like, no. <laughs> this is just wrong. <laughs> so, but that whole area is paved. And that area yeah. prior to that was farmland. And when it was farmland, the water in the soil would evaporate. But now, mm -hmm. because it's covered with pavement, the water can't evaporate. And the water table's actually risen beneath um, the Sphinx. And they mm -hmm. actually put in a dewatering system to draw the water table down to protect the Sphinx. Yeah, we actually so, had a question from yeah. uh, one of our subscribers who wanted to know, because we've watched some of your presentations on this topic, and what was the final outcome of what the, is it the Department of Antiquities, or who's who's working with uh, sorting out the, like, I guess you have to divert the water from the water table in that region so that there's not so much, you know, uh, erosion uh, from, the, from the water seeping up and, and wicking into the, to the area around the Sphinx? So what they did is they, they did groundwater modeling. I was just blown away when I found this, that there is a groundwater model. And what, what it is, is it's called dewatering. And you put in a series of wells and you pump the water out of the ground and that lowers the water table. And so that was US aid who um, was, was involved in that. And they spent like 30 some million dollars on this investigation. Um, wow. I got a picture of Lindsey Graham with his thumbs up between the paws of the Sphinx, because <clears throat> the U.S. paid for that. Exactly who is involved um, in Egypt, I don't know. I don't know this what was, agency. This was, was recent, huh? Like in the last five, ten years or what? Left, yeah, yeah, in that range, yeah. And they but, essentially um, solved the issue? Um, Good question. I'm not sure they did, because what they did is they lowered the water table to historic levels thinking, making the assumption that that would be enough. And um, I'm not sure because it was weathering that way before the water table rose. And mm -hmm. based on 
my modeling, again, using my software, it's borderline. They might need to draw the water table down lower than what it naturally would be, as opposed to restoring back to those levels. Nobody actually asked that question. And that's what mm -hmm. I did in, in, in my modeling, in my in this unpublished paper. It's, it's borderline. It might be good so, enough. It might not. So lowering the water table is the only option in terms of uh, solving that solution. Uh, my thought is like, if having sand that came in and filled up the Sphinx enclosure is what stopped the wicking before, uh, is there some sort of solution like that where you just kind of pack some sand in there and <laughs> fill it back up? <laughs> it would work if you took the Sphinx and buried it up to its lower back. Again, oh, it would take that. Much, it would take that much sand. I don't know how much sand it would take. That's a. Uh -huh. It would take a couple of feet. It wouldn't. It, you wouldn't have to fill it that high. Probably, I'm just going to guess a meter or two would be sufficient okay. to turn that off. But I so don't the... think that's what. Do do the bricks around the the lower section around the the arms and you know the lower part of the body and the feet? Do the bricks stop any of the wicking, or behind the bricks is it still slowly eroding? Or do we call it weathering or eroding from the wicking? I know Good there's a questions. difference between. Maybe you can explain yeah. the difference between. I was just going to do that. and erosion. <laughs> so weathering is like what happens when the limestone is slowly d dissolved by acidic groundwater which is what has happened to the limestone by the Sphinx. And that's weathering, but it doesn't actually move the rock. It doesn't take it and break uh -huh. it away from its location and move it to someplace else. Once the rock is being taken away and moved someplace else, that's erosion. So the weathering okay. makes it more susceptible to erosion, mm. but it isn't, it isn't actually transporting the rock from one location to another. The question before that on the, on the blocks, so the Sphinx is not alone as having this issue with the wicking groundwater. Um, hmm. It's occurring in the blocks on the Sphinx, and it's occurring at mosques throughout uh, Cairo. Anything that's built, uh, that's anything that's sitting on the ground now and um, is in contact with the soil, if it's shallow enough, the water's going to wick up and into the into the blocks. And so there's been a report, it was by AE Com, and they show um, some of the blocks on a mosque. And if you put the two s pictures side by side between the Sphinx and the mosque, you can't tell the difference because it's the same wow. process that's occurring there. So it's it's an issue all, all over Cairo and in many places around the world. So what about places <clears throat> like Luxor, for example, where the, the Nile's running, you know, a uh, hundred yards from Luxor and it's not had any protection from wicking or anything for a thousand, like it wasn't buried in sand as far as I know. Uh, well, like wh what is it that kept places like that from experiencing the wicking coming up in? So I would um, ask what, well, uh, so in part, to, there's two parts. First, I've never been to Luxor. Luxor, yeah. so um, I'm not sure exactly what's there, but if you're high enough above the water table, then you'd be fine. But also at this- It's like- it's very close to what I would, it, it's very low and like very close to the river. So that's why I was imagining that would be like a very susceptible place in terms of wicking, it seems. So the other thing is, is that the Nile floods would come through and wash away the salt. I, I mean, I'd have to look mm. at that site. So I can't, I can't address that. I, I'm speculating okay. at this point, but mm -hmm. the, the floods used to wash all of that away. So in the long run, as I see it, in the long run, the entire Nile, Nile Valley is no longer going to be useful for agriculture because the salt is building up and mm. it's no longer getting flushed away. So it's a matter of time until that no longer is suitable for growing anything. Well, yeah, but, so as ever yeah. since the uh, the Aswan Dam was built that the, the floods have stopped. When was that? Like in the 1960s or something? It was built in the 1960s. They finished it, I believe, in 1970. Mm. And what's really cool going to the Aswan Dam, because this gets into some of the moving on a little bit. When they built the dam, they thought that they were encountering, they would encounter a typical river valley. And like if you look at the Glen Canyon Dam, 
or um, Hoover Dam, what they do is they divert the river and then they excavate down to solid bedrock. And then they anchor the dam into the solid bedrock. And they did that. They tried to do that at Aswan. And the sides, they were fine. But the bottom, they never reached the bottom. They, mm -hmm. they, they could not find bedrock. And the reason being... This is kind of a cool thing, and I'm, for, I'm sure the first geologist who found this is like, what the? Because it would be impossible for a river to cut below sea level. As as a river approaches the sea, mm. it, it, it loses its ability to erode. And yeah, here, even at Aswan, it was below sea level. And they're like, how? Mm. The only way you could do that is to take Africa and put it three miles in the air, or the alternative is to take the Mediterranean and dry it up entirely. And mm. both would seem impossible. Mm. And it turns out that it was the Mediterranean that dried up. Yeah, yeah. And, I think this is fascinating. The... I, I wasn't sure if we were going to get into this in this podcast, but this is just <laughs> as a separate story of geological history of the Earth. The fact that the Mediterranean dried up, I mean, it doesn't really have anything directly to do with ancient human history or or the Sphinx. I mean, indirectly it does, but yeah, please tell us more about that. Uh, as far as I know, it dried up all the way down, what is it, a few miles down into like the bottom? Miles. It was, it's like yeah. the hottest place on Earth, like some 80 degrees Celsius or something? Yeah, yeah. How hot is that yeah, in Fahrenheit? Like, like 170? Don't quote That's me on crazy. that. I don't, uh, it is, it's crazy. Um, yeah, wow. and then that would have been, so that, that occurred in it may have ha happened more than once, but the odds are, I mean, we know for sure it happened at least once. But it does sort of come into play because the city of Cairo is sitting on a Grand Canyon that's filled in with river sediment. Mm. It's a mile and a, it's mm. five times longer and 25% deeper than the Grand Canyon. And the city of Cairo is on that. And so the Sphinx is at the very edge of that canyon. At the very, mm. very edge of, of a of a Grand Canyon, it just happens to be filled in. So it does relate when I so when I was trying to figure out where is this extra water coming from, I was like, and others other geologists have speculated, does it have something to do with this unusual situation of having river sediment a mile and a quarter deep that goes, you know, it's like four hundred feet something like that below Aswan. So wow. is that water somehow? Because water will go around a dam. And, you know, especially with sediment like that. And so we're like, well, could it actually be happening hundreds of miles downstream? It's where the water is actually then once again popping back mm. up into the aquifer. I don't think that's the case. But, you know, I mm. and other geologists who I've talked to about it, we were all of that. We're all speculating. Is that a possibility? So, yeah, it kind of does relate to to the Sphinx having been at the very edge of that canyon. So right in front, um, some people have, um, when they first found it, they said it's a uh, um, a fault, that there was an uplift, because they've noticed that there's this drop. I mean, it's not far in front of the Sphinx. It's about where the Pizza Hut is, if not closer, somewhere in that range. <laughs> and to what extent it drops, but that's, that's the start of the canyon. That's how close uh. the Sphinx is to the very edge of this giant canyon. So it does come into play in terms of how the groundwater is interacting with the bedrock and how the mm. water table has changed over time. So even so during that time period, when when the when the Mediterranean was dry from about six million years ago to about five point three million years ago, if there were Nile floods, the Sphinx would have been more than a mile above the floods, well beyond the reach. The limestone. Mm that the Sphinx has carved a well beyond the reach of those floods. So it, it is in part a part of that story in terms of how the Sphinx came to be. Wait, can I can I just pause you for a moment? You just said the, the Mediterranean was dried up for, what do you say, a, like a million years from 6 point million? 700,000 years, yeah. Wow, 700,000 years. And the whole time the Nile River was drastically lower, just carving this massive canyon and just dropping deep down into the... Mediterranean Valley? What would you call that? Yeah, yeah, into Death Valley. So yeah, and not wow. just the Nile, all the rivers 
that feed the Mediterranean can't keep up with evaporation. <clears throat> so every river along the, in, in the Mediterranean cut canyons mm. into this giant valley. And then the way that that ended is really kind of cool because what happens is, is the, the erosion of a stream is highest where it's steepest at the higher elevations. So there was actually a stream that was flowing from near Gibraltar down into the Death Valley. And the headward erosion eventually intersected the Atlantic. And then the Atlantic drained down this stream. You talk about a mega flood. The Atlantic yeah. <laughs> refilled the Mediterranean in, in probably like two years. Wow. The Mediterranean wow. was back. That's wild. Yeah, I actually met a, I was hitchhiking recently and met a geologist, a Greek guy. And I asked him about, because I was inspired by watching your uh, your presentation on, was it PBS? the When yeah. you're talking about the 40 million years and the Eocene and all this stuff. And he was telling me about the, um, what do you call it? The the, the salt crystals, um, uh, crystal crystallization or something. He used a technical term, where the way that they uh, first understood that this process had even happened, that the Mediterranean had dried up. Because uh, he said there's like three three ways you can find evidence for such a thing. One would be the canyons carving down. The other one is like uh, crystallization from all the salt that was in such a salt-rich mm -hmm. environment at the bottom. What's the, Do you know the technical term I'm looking for? The salt? Um, oh, I was trying to remember I'm this. I'm thinking evaporites, but... Um... Yeah, yeah, I think that was it. Yeah, yeah, evaporites. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's just it's just what's left over. And I did the calcs one time because I, I always heard, so it turns out, and this is again relevant to the Sphinx. <clears throat> so it turns out that the there's pan evaporation rates. There's people for over a hundred years, like over 150 years, they go out, there's places where they have these pans and they're like a meter or so across. And every time, every day, somebody walks over to it and puts in enough water to get it back to the level of water that was in it the day before. And so you, these are called pan, pan evaporation rates. And the pan evaporation rate for Cairo is 1.5 meters per year. That's an insane amount of evaporation. And if you take that times the surface area of the Mediterranean and figure out how long it's going to take, it takes it a thousand years. And that's where the estimate of how long it took the Mediterranean to dry came from, apparently, because that's you just do that simple calculation. And again, that comes into play at the Sphinx, which is why that, that wicking water is occurring. And when they did this study, going back to the study where they put in the dewatering system, they were saying that there's one and a quarter, something like this, one and a quarter meters of leakage that's adding this water to the uh, groundwater. And that's the reason that the water table came up. And they pointed to sewers, but there's no nitrates. And they pointed to um, to leaking municipal water supply systems. It's at the high end. It's possible. But so I, I'm saying, no, It like I said earlier, what's stopping all that evaporation, the same evaporation that caused the Mediterranean to dry is that they paved it and that that water is no longer evaporating. If you were to remove the pavement, I'm trying to remember my numbers. I think it's like three meters. The water table would drop like three meters or something like that in the first year alone. Mm, if you just yeah, simply yeah. removed. <clears throat> but yeah, it's a neat area. Wow. So so, so the other essentially thing like the, the water table has changed drastically throughout the millions of years, obviously, but even in the more recent thousands and hundreds of years, the water tables going up and down all the time and causing continuous uh, weathering inside the inside the bedrock. Maybe you can we can kind of guide this conversation back towards how it weathered the Sphinx even before it was ever carved. Exactly. So most of so yeah, so it weathered. It didn't erode. It weathered the Sphinx long before it was carved. So if you start looking at what was the ocean levels, well during particular times it was much higher than it is now because remember the sphinx is only 20 or it didn't say it yet but the sphinx is only 20 meters above sea level so it's only as far above sea level as it is tall uh -huh. but it's on the it's on the, it's in the nile floodplain it's in the nile river valley and the nile where the sphinx is is about 15 meters above sea level <clears throat> and that's going to adjust so if the sea level came up 
the Nile would adjust with that. And so if this if the sea level came up five meters, then the Nile would come up another five, basically. And that would flood, that would reach now the Sphinx enclosure, which is 20 meters above sea level. But mm -hmm. so even before it was carved, there were times when there were warmer periods and sea level was higher. And so the limestone that which the Sphinx was carved from would have been underwater. Even, mm -hmm. even if it wasn't Nile floods, it would have been permanently underwater. There were other times, as I pointed out, when you had the, 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 the Messinian salinity crisis, the drying of the Mediterranean, that it was more than a mile above the, 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 the Nile River. And it would have been high and dry. But mm. it's sort of like, think of a piece of metal. If you take a piece of metal and you bend it once and leave it, it's good. If you were to take that piece of metal and bend it back and forth, back and forth, over and over. So that's not good. So if you had taken the, the limestone and the Sphinx and put it underwater and left it there, fine. But they didn't. <laughs> that's not what happened. Is other times it was dry. So this mm. going back and forth is really what's going to weather that limestone in a way that it wouldn't have on its own. And the amount of carbon dioxide in groundwater is substantially higher than it is in the atmosphere and in the water above the water table. So it's 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 far more acidic and it dissolves those layers and it dissolves it along the fractures and also along bedding planes. So when they went to carve the Sphinx, mm. they found what's called the major fissure. Are you guys familiar with that? Is this on yeah. the, like on the back hips, uh, just yeah. like where the back paws are? Yeah, I yeah. find this interesting because I think of it as a crack, but then I heard you talk about it more as a cave. Like before the excavation began, it would have been uh, at least a very weathered, uh, almost not hollow because he said, as you said before, the erosion wouldn't have taken away the material, but there would be this cavity of very soft, very weathered limestone, which would technically kind of be a cave. Yeah. Or like a, just a pocket of softer material. And once they carved it away, they realized there's this huge, what we now see as a crack externally, but internally it was already weathered yeah. perhaps tens of million year, of years ago. Exactly. I mean, so the question I, I thought about, what do I call that? I'm glad you brought that up because technically it was a cave because I looked up what's the definition of a cave <laughs> and a cave is a void in the rock large enough for a person to enter, even if they have to remove some material, loose material to create that space. But <clears throat> I don't think I think that actually the the from what I know of the major fissure, it was probably actually an open cave because this is how caves form. So I don't think it was necessarily full of any debris. I think it was actually about a two meter wide or so void. It was, it was somewhat irregular mm. in shape. And I don't think the ancient Egyptians knew about that until they started carving down. And Mark Lehner is the one mm. who says that's why they extended the Sphinx body. And that's why the head is too small is because they... It, it, that's exactly where the rear paws of the Sphinx would have been carved if you had a proportionally sized body compared to the head. And they were like, yeah, it's well, way what do we too do? long, huh? The body yeah. is just like super dragged out, very long. <laughs> but I also point, nobody ever points out that it's not too wide. If If the head were carved smaller, then it should be equal and proportionally disproportionate from side to side as it is from front to back. And it's not, it's only disproportionate mm. in scale when you look at it from front to back. Nobody ever brings that up because it doesn't support mm. their idea. Um, so yeah, so they they elongated it. And not only that, they actually carved the rear paws in the in situ member one limestone. So that was not blocks to begin with. Those are newer blocks. Those are modern blocks that are covering the 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 rear paws and mm -hmm. mark laner actually in his dissertation mentions that he saw the carved toenails the claws and that they actually carved the claws back to put the blocks there mm. that's mm. ridiculous <laughs> what are they so they so they, the the original and then there's the shelf that sits on top of that member one limestone <clears throat> and so that that makes me realize that the whole thing i know i'm jumping around here a little bit but it makes me realize that no that that was originally there it's only the member two limestone that shows that undulating pa 
pattern um, that you see on the Sphinx body. And then the head is relatively um, pristine. So the question so, is, mm. how did that pattern occur? So it's your belief that the the Sphinx was originally in this kind of stepped form and then blocked over that uh, that kind of wave form that you see there? Yeah, so the bottom layer would have been carved in situ. So it was it, so what's a monolith? So it was, you know, using the term loosely, the, the, the Sphinx was a lot of people, most people think that the Sphinx was basically carved as a monolith, that it was all entirely carved out of the rock that was there in place. And that is certainly true of the rear paws, and that is certainly true of the head. But the center section was too soft. There's places in it that are so soft you could crumble it in your fingers. <clears throat> even if you used advanced modern technology or technology we haven't even invented yet, or if you want to imagine ancient aliens or whoever coming here, you cannot take rock that soft and carve it into a statue. That's impossible. Even if you did it, it wouldn't last. It would be so soft. So what the ancient Egyptians did is they took the member two limestone and they pounded it back. So how did they make it? So this is where I was looking at it. And I think a lot of people have looked at it this way and I was wrong for doing so. <clears throat> I was looking for geological explanation as to why the Sphinx looks eroded. Because it seems to be a geological question because it's eroded, but it's not eroded. That's They used two-handed pounders, so that's a rock like you know so big, and they just took that, and they banged it. You put that on a rock you can crumble in your fingers, you're going to pound it back and create that undulating surface. The harder layers are going to protrude, and then they also use stone hammers, which is a slightly smaller rock with, with sticks tied to it, and they bang on it that way, and they use copper chisels just for detailed work. So that's the answer. That limestone was so soft, they had no choice. So, And then if, if that's the case, if I'm right, well, then there needs to be a shelf on the very top of the member one limestone. Because you, 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 if you're going to send blocks on it, it has to sit on a basically a level surface. And there is. There is a level surface at the top of the member one limestone, and it goes right up to the undulating pattern. If, if that's erosion, then how come there's this angular contact right here where the underlying pattern is occurring? Mm. And then they slip the blocks in there, one on top of the other, and then they, they undercut at the neck and then tapered it in with the head. And that's why but you don't see that today at the head because that's been patched with concrete in the 1920s. But they, they were worried that, the, and that layer is one of the softest layers just below the head. Um, and they were worried about the Sphinx head actually toppling off. Probably wouldn't have. But that would be a tragedy, huh? Could you imagine? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, I would hate to see that. So yeah, so that's so that's what I'm saying is actually happened at the Sphinx. So that's not erosion. You know, it's it's a hard thing to do to say that everyone else is wrong. I know this is the world in which Hancock and Carlson and Shock live. But I'm like, if I'm going to say everyone else is wrong, I better back that up. <laughs> you know, it's just going to be one of those things like me getting on YouTube or getting on Joe Rogan and saying that. They don't have any evidence for that. They, they use other people's evidence and they pick and choose that which they think supports. And I think the important supports them. And I think the important part is they think because oftentimes they're presenting evidence that proves themselves wrong and they don't realize it. <laughs> mm. So in like in the most basic form what is your kind of hypothesis for what happened in terms of it was a built in you know the fourth dynasty and then it was already weathered they they kind of removed some of the uh fragile parts of it and then reinforced it with uh bricks that then uh, oh that's a good so question it, so I want to back up a little bit so what what did Giza look like before this is kind of relevant because this this helps you date when it would be um so george reisner i didn't know this but george reisner said and it's in mark laner's dissertation said that the top of the sphinx head basically marked the top of the giza um anticline i'll call it um so that it was down. not a yarding 
apparently, huh? That was no, just it was the not... surface. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it really, I, I just, do you know who Farouk Elbaz is? Uh, I've heard the name. Oh. So he's this really, really cool Egyptian geologist. I mean, I wish I had a career or anything close to his. He trained the Apollo astronaut who stayed behind in the command module circling the moon. He trained him mm -hmm. to identify what features there were on the moon. And back in the day, they weren't sure. Some people were saying those are volcanic craters. Those aren't impact craters. And and so he trained geologists, to, and the astronauts, to to do that to look at it and there were a lot of people who were um a lot of geologists who were saying those are those are not impact craters those are volcanoes so he did that and yeah he proposed that the the, the sphinx was a hill that it was a yarding which is an erosional feature um in the desert and yardangs can definitely take on the shape of a sphinx um I've seen them out there in the Sahara. I was lucky enough to do that. And you just look around and you see things that look a lot, you guys probably have too, that look a lot like pyramids. And there's other things that look a lot like um, a Sphinx. Or, I mean, if you've been in Utah, I mean, there's like Goblin Valley. Oh, yeah. Things like that. <clears throat> um, so, yes. But so he said that. But let's assume for a moment, let's try this. <laughs> the Sphinx is carved from a yarding. Okay. So that means that the surrounding rock, so don't, the, the surface you're seeing at Giza today is not a natural surface. And so many people like Reader and Chuck and everyone, they're like looking at that surface and saying, you see how the groundwater would flow towards the Sphinx and, and that, you know, that the sheet flow and all this stuff. Well, if it were a yarding, there would have been natural surface flow away from a yarding and mm. if you carve the sphinx that natural flow away from a hill would remain there but that's not there so th if you did build the sphinx then you'd have natural drainage having actually diverted the water around not towards a hill how far around the the yarding let's say the yarding was i don't know 10 meters wide or something how far around like would it go a hundred meters around, you'd be able to see like, uh, you know, the shape of the I, natural I, hill where water would flow around. I, it. I can't answer. I can't answer that because it didn't happen. I mean, I, I, there's no evidence <laughs> of that. So what, what actually happened is <clears throat> that there is a capstone. And so when you look at a feature like that as a geologist, you're going to say, well, why is this hill here? What's going on? Why, why is the Giza anticline there? And it's because there is this harder layer and that's the member three limestone of the Sphinx head. And the, wh what happened over millions of years is the overlying rock was eroded away. And there was a particularly soft layer just above the member three limestone. And we know that because of the wadi just to the south of Giza, just to the south of the Sphinx. That's the, That was the overlying rock. How soft it is, what, what's there, I don't know, but it, it's definitely softer. And so that anticline, I mean, that harder layer is what caused the Giza anticline to be there in the first place. So the member three limestone of the Sphinx head covered the entire area, and it wasn't big enough to carve a lion head. There's just no mm. evidence of that. Any geologist would look at the cross section and say, well, then explain this wadi to the south here. Because Sh So Shock's depiction of a lion head at Sphinx is, is impossible based on my reconstruction of, of the area. And it, that's not the only reason why I don't think that's the case, but it's a big one. Should I, I, I am I on a tangent? No, did Milo freeze? I think so. Did you guys freeze as well? I'm frozen here. Uh-oh. Oh, oh are we back? Okay. We He's froze. Back. I'm back. Did I freeze <laughs> or was it you guys? Yeah. You froze. You froze. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't me anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's my turn now. <laughs> so how how so anyway, thick so was that... the member three? Like when you said where the wadi, they could see the original. Was it two or three or four I meters? I can tell thick? you, it's about the thi so it's about the nine meters, if I remember right, the thickness of the Sphinx head. That's how it's... thick that layer was. Okay. Now, so it when, wasn't when all, it wasn't the West... pristine. 
Yeah, go ahead. It wasn't. I gotta explain this. It isn't the pristine, nice, flat surface that you see when you go to be a tourist there today. It would have been an irregular surface that had been ero had er erosion had been working on over millions of years. It would not have. It would have had drainage. You couldn't have gotten sheet flow over that. And and if you built the Sphinx, I saw you guys were in Ethiopia. It would have been like those the temples in Ethiopia. It would have been entirely. <laughs> below we've, grade we've never been to ethiopia <laughs> I, I thought you were there i thought i saw a picture no mm -hmm. what was no. the you saw it on our channel like on youtube or i thought so I, I was watching something it was like at the at the beginning it looked like you were in ethiopia where there's these mm. temples that are built they're carved out of the solid rock and ah, they basically just carved been, down uh it could have been uh where was it casey in in colorado or um What's it called? Uh, we did a trip across America. It could have been one of those where, uh, oh shoot, it was years ago. I forget the culture now. Where they built into the side of these canyons and caves. Was it one of those sites? You, yeah. you know what I'm talking about, Casey? I don't. Definitely not Ethiopia. Then. <laughs> oh, okay, I thought you guys were there. I thought, okay, cool. You've been there. I can use that. As... I would love to go to Wait, Ethiopia. So <laughs> yeah. Maybe someday. So, so, uh... So Graham Hancock has been there. In fact, that's the first time I saw him was there when he was talking to Michael Palin from Monty Python when he was doing, I think, his pole to pole journey. I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Palin. Anyways, <laughs> so so had the Sphinx been carved prior to the pyramids because that all was quarried to build the pyramids. So had the Sphinx been carved at any point prior to carving the pyramids, I'm saying the entire Sphinx, including the head, would have been below ground level. Today, from the basically the shoulders down, from the back down, it's below ground level. But it would have been entirely below ground level because that was the original surface that was there. And that, that's a conclusion made by George Reisner. Mm. So nobody ever mentions that. They, when they When they talk about and so when they talk about flow eroding the Sphinx, they have to be talking about that higher layer. And if they're talking about a yarding, then they have to explain why a drainage pattern that was flowing from a yarding suddenly reverses and now is flowing towards where the yarding was and to into the Sphinx enclosure. It doesn't make mm. sense. Mm. And, and again, you know, are those conclusive points? But no, but... Has has shock or anybody provided any conclusive point to say that it is older? No. So one of the things, and now I'm going to go off on a tangent here, on the seismics. So um, shock went out with Debecki and did a seismic survey of the Sphinx enclosure. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah. Like back in the in the nineties or the, yeah, ninety two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what they did. <clears throat> It's really deceptive is they said that there is a high velocity anomaly to the north of the sphinx and they said this is the greatest this is the highest velocity anomaly north of the sphinx they never mention equally high seismic anomalies to the south of the sphinx they didn't they, they were carefully worded it to say that this is the highest seismic velocity anomaly north of the sphinx is this the they went out of their of way records? so-called no. records. well this yeah so so yeah so that's so they so this leads them to say that there's a so-called hall of records but what it does prove is so a seismic what a seismic tomography like a cat scan it's a very similar process will only measure directly between two points you're going to send put the signal in here seismic signal here and you're going to pick it up here and it's just going to measure that velocity in between here it can't go down and then come back up and discern what's at depth and all you can do is just move to different points. And if you did go lower, then you could map in the third dimension. You could actually do that. But they never did that. So all they did is they measured seismic velocities at the level of the Sphinx enclosure floor. And based on that, it shows that the, that the seismic velocities beneath the Sphinx are lower, meaning that the rock is more weathered the more weathered the rock is, the slower the seismic velocity. So it shows that the rock beneath the Sphinx is more weathered than the than the limestone in the exposed sections of the Sphinx enclosure floor. This is exactly the opposite of what they proposed would happen. They said that the enclosure floor has been exposed to precipitation 
for 12,000 years. So it has been exposed to the environment and it should be more weathered than the limestone beneath the Sphinx because it was protected by the Sphinx itself. They got exactly the opposite pattern. Do they report that? No, what they say instead is, is that they somehow were able to discern what's going down 25 meters below ground level. That's impossible. That's just plain out impossible to do that with the technique that they used. And then, and if you read carefully, they're not saying it came from their information. It came from another survey by a Japanese group, and that they're saying that they, what they're saying is consistent with that. <clears throat> but they don't point out that their assumption is wrong. And it's just, it's plain. <laughs> so I think they're counting on people not knowing, and, or, or maybe they've deceived themselves. I don't know. The other thing is, is that... Um, Keeping it, keep, staying with shock here for a moment, when he said that the Sphinx had a lion head, and um, I sent you some of the some of the presentations, and in one of those you'll see where the what the back of the Sphinx head looked like prior to the concrete patch being applied, and so the greatest extent of erosion is actually at the back side of the Sphinx head, and if you were to put over that shock's depiction of a lion and he's going to back away from it because he said well that's what that came from the tv show i didn't have control over that they put that in. he uses that in his lectures so he cannot step away from it if you use that there's 14 meters of erosion from the back from the greatest distance or the shit, lowest distance between the originals what he calls the original sphinx head and the and the undercutting the erosion at the bottom Thanks for doing that. <laughs> oh, did it work? I'm Wait seeing it says you started screen sharing. I was thinking of doing that myself. Uh, there it is. I... Yeah, are you seeing? Yeah, I'm seeing it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I hope I did. So that if right. you look at that, so look at where it says head. The D in the in that word head is, and then look at that distance from that to the undercut at the back of the Sphinx before the concrete patch was applied. That little notch at the back. Mm. That's 14 meters. That's, as That's an high, insane amount high. of material that would have had to have been eroded. And not only that, it's the high quality member three limestone. If we're if mm. shock is to be believed. Now, then you have the Sphinx enclosure floor. So that's that's more than the Sphinx body's tall. And now you have the Sphinx enclosure floor in which the water was coming over and supposedly eroding the sidewalls back, but didn't erode the floor at all. When water comes over the edge of a cliff or anything like that, it cuts hardest at the floor. It does mm. not cut back. Mm. Waterfalls, like Palouse Falls you've seen, they move back because the, 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 um, the, the what do you call it, the plunge pools under, undermine the cliff, and then the cliff collapses. That's and Niagara Falls and other falls, they work upstream because of that process. It isn't erosion occurring where the water's falling, it's erosion that's occurring where the water hits at the base. There is no erosion on the base of the Sphinx enclosure floor. And as Chuck's seismic survey points out, that's the most eroded. That's the not most that's the most weathered rock. Mm. That rock is very susceptible to erosion as opposed to the head, which is not susceptible to erosion. Because it's that high quality limestone. Did Shock ever this give any uh, any good reason or explanation as to why the floor around the Sphinx wasn't eroded? I mean, it it looks like a nice no. flat, you know, surface. Did he ever? It is. Answer that. Of course that not. Riddle, of course not. He just no, avoids you're not the question. To bring it or? up. You're sp you're supposed to follow wherever he takes you, and you don't bring that up. Uh -huh. You follow the evidence that they present. <laughs> And don't ask questions. You just stare at him starry-eyed and go, wow, what a cool guy. Yeah. That's yeah. what you're supposed to do. <laughs> he changed the world. <laughs> so essentially here where the water would flow down through the 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 inclined wall of the enclosure wall there, it would leave behind at, at the at the base these massive channels cut into the floor as well. Yeah. Well, it would cut there for most it would it would have cut plunge pools it would cut you you've been to dry falls you've seen those plunge pools yeah yeah yeah. do the same thing just on a smaller scale there's it's exactly where is that why isn't that here mm. 
and and the assumption is being made and i don't think there's any reason to do this and that is is that the sidewalls of the sphinx enclosure were in fact vertical what if they sloped them i mean if you look at the slope on those walls they look at about the same angle as the pyramids behind and and here's one of the other mm. questions that nobody ever brings up because what they're saying, let's let's go to their nonsensical story of, of the conspiracy theorists, ancient uh, alternative archaeologists, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, let's so go they're with saying the term you... alternative researchers. I feel like I I don't necessarily <laughs> want to say pseudo uh, archaeologists or something because I I don't want to create any like division amongst this side and that side. I'd like cool, to try like to unify. That. So yeah, alternative I think is a, a good way to put it. No. I'm not sure what used what word to use myself. Alternative researchers. I, I'll think about that one. But so they when the Egyptians <laughs> came, when the Egyptians came, they they said, "Oh my God, there's a, a sphinx here with a lion head, kind of eroded. We'll turn that into a pharaoh, maybe because maybe that's not what the pharaoh even looked like according to them, anyways. So that they they, they raised questions about their own. <clears throat> but then they renovated the sphinx and they put blocks on it. And they made it all look all nice and pretty. But they didn't do a fucking thing to the walls. Why would they do that? Why would the Egyptians come in there? Why didn't they erase? Why didn't they recarve the walls? According to Shock, they recarved the Sphinx, they recarved the temples, but they did not. For some strange reason, they left the eroded surface of the sidewalls, these ugly eroded surfaces. The ancient Egyptians didn't do a thing with it. Why? It makes no sense. Mm. And again, you're not supposed to bring these things up because we're supposed to look where well, they point. So even even if the conclusion is wrong, him bringing shock, bringing attention to this and bringing it up, would there be much of a discussion about this otherwise? Like, so for me, from my perspective, and for you know the last however many years that I was following Shock's work and like really intrigued by this and believing it in a lot of ways, uh, it got me interested in like this whole narrative and discussion. And so like my question is like in what ways like did is even that wrong assumption or wrong conclusion pushing this ex? exploration and understanding of the Sphinx further to where more geologists are getting involved and more uh, more of the mysteries of what's there are actually being acknowledged. I love the question. I think that's a really great question. I mean, first off, so geologists aren't really that interested in the Sphinx. When I'm, when I'm talking about the Sphinx, I get this look like, really, why are you wasting your time on that? Mm. It's it's not something that geologists are all that interested in. And I'll go on a slightly different tangent. To me, even to even to the Egyptologists and to the archaeologists, the Sphinx isn't all that interesting. It's like dinosaurs. So dinosaurs are really fascinating to the general public. But there's like these single cell organisms, Numulites gizihensius, for instance, to pick on the Sphinx. And there are a dime a dozen. You, you can take these and find them. You can grind them up. You can look for changes in isotope concentrations. You can see when they go extinct because there's so many of them. It, it tells the story. The Sphinx, like the dinosaurs, aren't really telling the story. You need to find other things from elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. But there's the flip side, which is you, and I have to include myself in this, is think of all the things that you've done, like we're doing this right now. I never would have done this had it not been for Shock and Hancock and Carlson. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, I've been to places, I have done things, I've met people, and, and I've learned things I never would have learned had it not been for that. So yeah, mm -hmm. they're in, and I, yeah. I saw them on Rogan and they were saying that and I was like, yeah. One of the things that really stood out for me when I did this and I learned more about archaeologists because I'm not, is how many of the archaeologists actually got involved with archaeology because they were looking for some ancient aliens, lost civilization kind of thing. Yeah. 
<laughs> Mark well, yeah, Lanier. Mark, yeah, Mark Lanier, right? <laughs> You're Wasn't not alone. he originally interested <laughs> yeah. in the, the Hall of Records and Edgar Casey and all this kind of stuff? I mean, people think of yeah, Mark he... Lanier as the, you know, epitome of the mainstream Egyptologist, but he came to that from the alternative perspective, right? Without question. Well, it, I guess I guess this is the feeling I'm having is like, why can't why can't it all just be this like uh right I, I guess like rather than mark laner being interested in this thing and he changed his mind and now he's in this thing like why can't it be he's also maybe still interested in that thing it's just less he's more uh forward facing in this uh more scientific approach to it i guess for me it's like i'm still very much interested in uh i, I guess maybe more esoteric topics uh and I and it, without Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson and all these people, I wouldn't have traveled to all these places in the world with no. deep interest. And so for me, I'm like caught in this middle place of like, Ooh. I really uh, respect the their work in the sense that it got me interested. And over the last few years, I've also been scratching my head of like, why do these guys seem so deceptive? <laughs> like, <laughs> there's this like, there's this flip-flopping that I'm experiencing of like I've always thought Graham has been a great guy and like very interesting and I love his writing and also now like is he lying to me like what's happening here uh <laughs> I don't know if anybody's lying I I think that I want to go on that for a second I don't think they're lying as much as they've convinced themselves yeah and I think the thing think that you're talking about yeah yeah but I think the thing that you're talking about is something that I'm very much aware of when I was younger, there were really like great programs that would tell you big picture science. There's no cool big picture science. There's nobody taking these amazing discoveries that we have and giving the general public any idea of what it is that we've learned. And Hancock and Carlson and Schock and all those guys, they are selling really, really cool big picture science that they're basing on what they see as evidence. And, and it's very enrapturing. It's, it's really cool. That's, that's, I think, the stuff that's really missing. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's, I think that's what enamored you. That's, you know, that's, that's how you got there. It's like, this, what, this is real? And, mm -hmm. and the nature of the reality of the world makes the human imagination ridiculous because it's so much easier to imagine picking on the Sphinx again a lost civilization than to imagine that the entire Sahara turns green every 20,000 years. Mm -hmm. you know, that's an area bigger than the United States. So if you're using human imagination, nature goes beyond that. You have to look and say, what's going on here? And then you're like, is that real? Mm, it's really yeah. dead? And then all of a sudden you understand where the Egyptian came, civilization came from and why there was no evidence earlier because the Nile Valley was uninhabitable during mm. the green sahara periods because there was so much water the nile is almost the same length and about one third the collection area the basin of the amazon but it has a tiny it has about one percent the flow of the amazon but during the green sahara period mm. it challenges the nile as the most powerful river on earth and that's real you mean the amazon mm -hmm. yeah to surpass well, and, it, it, and, and probably has hasn't the the Sahara gone uh, green like yeah from desert periods to green periods like hundreds of times wasn't it like in the last eight million years if I remember it's been, they've documented some two hundred two hundred and thirty times that it's exactly, returned yeah. to a desert and to a savanna full of green yeah. vegetation and rivers and lakes and then back to desert yeah. again I mean that's incredible. Yeah. And it just to happened me, recently, driven... like only, what is it, five and a half thousand years ago? And because yeah. the yeah. green turned into a desert, people had to follow the water, which led them to the Nile Valley. And they said, oh, this is a good place to settle. And then they They got started... there just as that land was exposed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So before that, yeah, it's, it's essentially just, it's the, the Nile Valley just not would have, it would not have been a good place for, for farming, for agriculture. Like it would have been flooding, massive floods, uh, like... A big part of the year and, and also if, even... if the sphinx was there wouldn't it have just been entirely eroded away or massively yeah. damaged 
you've seen what channel that this gab lines, what floods can do, you know? So here's this thing that's buried on the very edge of the river. <clears throat> it's going to be wiped out. It's going to be gone, mm. at least at least partially destroyed. And yet it, it doesn't, and the, and the temples too would have to have been because they're contemporaneous. Well, they'd be out in the flow. Well, why are they there? How come that rock is still there? So yeah, they, it undermines all of it. You could argue, so at times, you know, this goes back and forth. So like during the ice age, the, because the Mediterranean, again, getting into why the Nile, why the Mediterranean disappearing is relevant. During an ice age, the Nile would quickly wash out all that soft sediment. So the, the Sphinx would be sitting a couple hundred feet above the, the, the floodplain during the ice age. And then as the ice age ends, <clears throat> the sea level comes up and, and again, it's going to start inundating the Sphinx and at other times even covering it. So the whole thing just goes back and forth. <clears throat> Where was I going with that? Anyways, the whole story, you know, the, 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 for me, the really cool story was the things that I learned. Cause I never heard, I, I, if you've looked at my stuff, it seems like you have like the, the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. I, I was like dumbfounded when I, when I learned about that, I'm like, this is real. I just remember when I first learned, cause I did, I did all my research on the Sphinx and I said, look, this, I can't, there's nothing in the last 4,500 years that could explain the erosion of the Sphinx. There's just no way that that's happened. And, and the Egyptologists, you know, condensed that even to a shorter period to say that it all happened in the first 1100 years. So by Tutmos the fourth in 1400 BC, that the Sphinx was already eroded. And that's when he covered it with the, the first layer of blocks. I'm saying those are original. They were put mm -hmm. there originally in shock. Here we kind of agree because he said that those and, and and all those guys, they would say that it's um, when the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians put them there. And that's consistent with the type of limestone that it is. <clears throat> but to find out that there was this event, I don't know how I got on that tangent, but to find out there was this event, if, oh, when I learned that that rock, when I couldn't figure out why that was eroded, I said, well, when was this rock deposited? And so I looked and I said, oh, the Eocene. And I was actually, I got to tell you, I was disappointed because I was thinking, you know, something really cool, you know, maybe during the age of the dinosaurs or something. And I was like, well, you know, nothing much has happened in the last 50, you know, 65 million years, slow rise of the mammals. And here we are. And, and I kind of thought that's the whole story. It turns out that's so oversimplified that that is not the case at all that the mammals had a hard time recovering for about 9 million years. And then 56 million years ago, when the earth was already substantially warmer, there was this massive release to greenhouse gases to Earth's atmosphere. And it warmed the planet, and it didn't cause an extinction. I mean, some animals, I'm sure, went extinct. But in general, it caused another explosion in genetic diversity with first horses, primates, camels, all sorts of things like that. <clears throat> to me, that was like, What? I, I for for several months I read every article I could find on on hyperthermals to realize that there were more, and then I was like, well, I'm not I shouldn't I'm wasting my time looking at the Sphinx, <clears throat> and then when I looked back at the Sphinx after doing this like three four months, I looked at the Sphinx head and I said, oh my goodness, that's that's a hyperthermal. It has all the characteristics mm. of a hyperthermal. And I'm like, okay, other people are seeing lost civilizations, and I'm now seeing hyperthermals in the Sphinx. I've become <laughs> as crazy as <laughs> the odds of that exposure, <clears throat> one of these exposures actually happening in the in the layer of, that the Sphinx is carved out of is like zero. And and, mm. and hyperthermals weren't found until 1991, the first one. And so to the idea that a hyperthermal has been staring us in the face of the Sphinx for the past 4,500 mm. years and no geologist realized this, that's just crazy. And it, so I, mm. I kind of sat on that idea for years. And then when I met up with Randall Carlson and we shook hands to debate, we kind of went back and forth on what we know and what we don't know. And I said, well, I'm up on the Sphinx and Gebekli Tepe, but I don't really know 
the scab lands. And he said, well, I know the scab lands and the sphinx, so, uh, but I'm not familiar with Gebekli Tepe. So I decided I need to get up to speed. So I spent thousands of dollars thinking that Randall Carlson was true to his word and that we're actually going to have this debate and went to the scab lands. <clears throat> and I contacted Bruce Bornstead, who's written the guidebooks. Are you familiar with Bruce? I've heard the name. We don't know him. Yeah, he's a, he's a good guy. So I asked him if he would give give me a private tour and I explained why. And he said, sure, but why don't you go to the GSA conference? We've got a four-day field trip after the conference with the principal investigators. He said, why don't you go? And I said, I don't know. Why don't I go? So I ended up going <laughs> to the... So I did, and I went to the Geological Society of America meeting. And like I say, I was sitting on this idea of the Middle Eocene climatic optimum this hyperthermal being exposed in the Sphinx. And I'm at the conference and somebody I don't recognize walks up to me and says, I think you're right. And I'm like, of course, <laughs> of course I'm right. On what? And then he said the Miko in the Sphinx and I instantly realized who it was. He's one of the professors at the University of Wisconsin-Madison here. I'm in Madison. And <clears throat> he studies hyperthermals. And I sent him some papers and an email and he reviewed those and he said, yeah. So I sat on that for years looking for some confirmation that this ridiculous thing might be true. So it was. So then that was in 21. So in 22, I presented a paper on that at the Geological Society of America meeting in Denver. And at the same time, Walter Alvarez is presenting a paper. Do you know who that is? No, no. You ever hear of an asteroid that killed off the dinosaurs? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Who found the iridium layer? Ah, oh, okay. I'll give you a clue. I'm guessing. <laughs> Walter <laughs> and his father who found the iridium layer. And so I'm I'm talking to Walter Alvarez. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm at a conference mm. and I'm talking to him. <clears throat> and then he was he gave a presentation and this kind of relates back to it what what uh, Randall Carlson said one time when he was on Joe Rogan where he talks about the overtopping of Lake Victoria have you seen that mm -hmm. so he's he's talking about that and so that water would he said that's the reason that there was all this excess flow going down the Nile Valley well this is another instance where Randall Carlson is just completely wrong <laughs> he has mm. no idea he found an article an old article that talks about that. We've learned a lot since. And a part of it is, is that that water goes into what's called uh, the, the Sud Swamp. And it's a, it's a swamp, I've heard various estimates, some are as large as, this, as France. <clears throat> and most of the water, so it turns out that in my software, this blew me away, in my software, there's a reference to the Bar El Gazelle, which is one of the rivers that feeds the Sud Swamp. And they and of the thirty three point seven cubic kilometers of water, to put that in miles, think an eight mile square. So think of it eight miles to the left, eight miles to the right, and eight miles straight up into the sky. That amount of water evaporates every year, and only 0.6 kilometers goes downstream. So this is why Randall Carlson is wrong. That water, the, the overtopping of Lake Victoria did occur as he mentions, but that water came from the Green Sahara. There was another Nile River, the Yellow Nile, and all the other wadis were active. <clears throat> and that's why the Nile Valley was flooded. It has nothing to do, or virtually nothing to do with the overtopping of Lake Victoria. But Walter Alvarez is presenting a paper on the Sud having been a mega lake. And I was like, not familiar with that, but I knew the area and I was talking to him about some of the rivers. And he kept asking me, how do you know this? Nobody knows this. How do you know this? And I only know it because of the things that I've done with the Sphinx. And then what was really cool at one point, he goes, can I, you know, what's your paper? And I said, well, it's about an exposure of the uh, hyperthermal in the head of the Sphinx. I said, it's sort of, sort of like finding the iridium layer that killed off the dinosaurs. And I can't believe I'm telling you this. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I have, I, we, we have, I have Randall Carlson to thank for that. Even though I spent mm. thousands of dollars because you know, he's not going to ante up, apparently. I've already dismissed him as ever doing anything. Oh, I was going to say one thing is never trust anything that any of the conspiracy theorists say. And not just in terms of whether they're going to debate you or not, go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, as he said, but any of the facts that they give. 
when I first got involved in this, I found myself listening to shock on some of these things that he was saying. I was thinking that, well, he's, he's right about that. And then you realize, no, don't, don't use anybody listening. Don't use the information that they present. It's partially true, but it's very select and it's very select in the way that they present it. So anyways, mm. well, uh, real quick to, to touch on that. I, I, I believe that uh, that debate could happen, and I hope it does happen between you and Randall. And maybe we could even call it a, a discussion. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily do that. be a debate. Um, I reached out to Brad, his uh, you know partner in crime and very good friend, uh, some month ago, and we had some dialogue about it. And after this conversation with you, it's going to reignite me to want to reach out to him again, because yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting you know, potential for people to have these kind of debates. And, and I've heard a lot of the alternative researchers calling for debate. You know, there was the, the one scheduled that didn't happen this last fall between Graham Hancock and uh, Flint, uh, is it Flint Dibble, Diddle, Dibble? And that got postponed. Dibble. I'm looking forward to that. I guess it'll be sometime this spring. And I know that from the alternative um, archeological, you know, camp, they definitely are calling for debates. It just seems ironic at times when some of them are presented with debates, they pick and choose and they try to avoid them. It happened to us with another story long, uh, some couple years ago, which I won't really get into the details about. But uh, with Randall, I'll definitely, I would like to reach out to him again and, and invite, I mean, I think you guys should have a discussion, especially you shook hands on it and yeah. everything. I mean, it, I think it's only healthy. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like any ill feelings or anything between different di people with differing opinions. I think it's uh, on a scientific level, we need to discuss all different angles about the geology of the Sphinx or the Scablands or whatever it is that our topic is that we're interested in. We should discuss all of the angles together and, and pick apart any of the flaws within our theories. And I think it's really important to have open debate, open conversation. Uh, so I'd say, yeah, maybe keep, keep optimistic. Let, let's hope that can happen. But and uh, I, would, I, I have I would to, love to I hear have to that. I have to compliment. I mean, in some ways, and I told Randall that when I met him, I said, he just gives these really fantastic descriptions. And I told him he would have made one hell of a geology professor. Uh -huh. <laughs> he does He does better descriptions of geological processes than almost anybody I've ever heard. And his, his level of detail and pulling up specific dates and stuff, I'm like, wow, that is so cool. Yeah, he has a genius but mind. He, it's incredible how yeah. much information he has. And he's a great storyteller. <laughs> Um, oh, I would definitely. love to like discuss Randall's work and where you disagree with him also on the Scablands, but maybe we can wrap it up on, on the Sphinx. I'm curious in general, if we can kind of summarize where it is that you disagree. Like I, I was watching the other day, the, the video from David Miano and he has the battle of the geologists, which I really like this, uh, yeah. this term. And you're in there, of course, and Jim Harrell, <laughs> who we spoke to, um, when we made our video series on the Serapium and Jorn Christensen and Kayla Algori and Jean-Pierre Houdin and Colin Reeder. And uh, I think that all geologists would agree on one main point is that you absolutely cannot uh, date the Sphinx by using geology alone because it's such a complex process which has happened over millions of years, right? So am I right on that? And where do you disagree? I'm, I may, I I disagree on that. I think I figured out how you can date it. Oh yeah, so so yeah, <laughs> yeah. all of them would agree, but Cause you because I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, and I sort of stumbled on it because I'm writing a paper. I'm I'm finally putting this in in a paper, and it's it's gone to like forty five pages long. I tried writing a really brief version of it, and David Miano and I were working on it together for a while. Yeah, um, he mentioned that he when, some... when we spoke with him last year. He yeah. said you guys were writing a paper. It still hasn't been published yet. No, I mean, so David sat on it for the longest time. I'm like, you know, there's a part of me, you can't hurry it because I want him to think about it. And he actually challenged me. I don't want to get into this, but he challenged me. And I was like, damn it, you can't do that. That's, uh. and, and I was just so frustrated. And I went out for like two weeks. I was like, I understand why he wants to do this experimental. What he wanted us to do was go out and find some limestone that was similar to the Sphinx and pound on it with, stone tools to create the same underlying <laughs> uh, undulating pattern and i was like well you'd have to find the same rock that has gone through the same 
things and even then sounds like you got to go to egypt together huh take a trip across the <laughs> <laughs> well and where would that be i mean where would you find that rock and it, when we found it and did it they just simply say that we did that you know and what does it prove we just that we found a rock to prove that we were right it's not going to prove anything and <clears throat> and in fact the, the very episode that i saw mark laner on he did that. They were carving on that episode of Nova. I don't know if you've ever seen it, where they were going to carve a new Sphinx nose. Yeah, yeah, I've he seen went it. Yeah, mm -mm. and 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 they failed. They had to use modern tools, and and so they also at the same time they were um, having a a, an, uh, a a carver, a sculptor in Egypt, take some of the same limestone or similar limestone there in Egypt, and carve a, a mini Sphinx out of it. And he was complaining it was dulling his stainless steel tools. So I was like, no, that's that's just not going to work. But it did get me to think about something. And I think it sort of supersedes everything. So having somebody challenge your thoughts when you when you're trying to do it, David did that in a really wonderful way. And I have to thank him mm. for that. I was mm. like, I was like, ah, but yeah. So he, I think he's too busy with his YouTube channel. And I'm also busy with other things. So yeah, I don't think we're working on that together anymore. We're we're definitely okay. not. But his input, <laughs> his input, it's not like we're not like we have any disagreement or anything. His input was just so valuable. I mean, he's going to get mm. a, a heavy footnote in in this paper for his uh, amazing contribution, which anyways. So what's my conclusion on the Sphinx? The Sphinx was built <clears throat> everything about it says it was built at the same time as the pyramids, 4,500 years ago. There's nothing that says differently. And if you use the principle of cross-cutting relationships, are you familiar with that in geology? No. Oh, well, maybe. So it's, you know, so it's Nicholas Steno in 1669, and he came up with a few principles. And one was, and we used to use the analogy if you stacked your newspapers in the garage. We don't do that anymore, but the oldest <laughs> newspaper is at the bottom. <laughs> <clears throat> and 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 you know and you could tell by the dates and and so that was one of the things and if if you took a knife then and and stabbed it through the newspapers well the newspapers had to be there for the knife to go through so you can't stack more newspapers on once you put the knife through so you can you can put together a relationship and say well what must have come first and when you take a geology 101 class they'll give you these pictures little cartoons and you have to label from from beginning to end, what's the oldest and what's the newest? <clears throat> and once you once you get good at this, it's it's pretty obvious. So the, at the Sphinx, one of the things that really stands out is the causeway. The ancient Egyptians were, and this is just one of the pieces of information. The ancient Egyptians were obsessed with aligning things east, west, north, south. But the causeway isn't aligned east, west, north, south. It slopes downhill from the from the pyramid down towards the the valley temple. So that would imply that the causeway was there, or at least planned to be mm -hmm. there prior to the Sphinx being carved. Because if you carve the Sphinx, you take the southern wall and make it run east-west. And if you made it run east-west, and you had it the same distance from the north side to the south side, which it pretty much is at the at the east end, mm -hmm. then it would cut into the causeway. So right there. <laughs> That's a, and then when you look at a typical pyramid complex, so there's the pyramid, there's the mortuary temple, the causeway, and the valley temple. And that's that's a typical pyramid complex, and I'm not that familiar with this. <clears throat> so that makes the valley temple contemporaneous with the pyramid. And since the valley temple has some of the same blocks that came out of the Sphinx enclosure, that makes the valley temple contemporaneous with the construction of the Sphinx. And so... There's nothing to say the Sphinx is older. And how could you date it? <laughs> okay, so there's a, there's what I call a test boring at the far west end of the Sphinx and to the uh, alternative researchers that is, and, and even to the uh, to the archaeologists, <laughs> the Egyptologists, they, they don't know what that is. So it's thought that it could be, so Mark Lehner and Sahih Was are saying that perhaps it was carved as uh, for grave robbers who are trying to find some hidden treasure buried beneath the Sphinx. 
Is this the, the the little cavern that's at like the where the butt is on the backside? Yeah, yeah. Or some people yeah. say it's the hidden chamber where they're hiding all the secrets. Exactly. You're saying <laughs> no. essentially the Egyptians originally were were doing like test pits where they dig down to test the quality of the limestone. Yeah, nobody's gonna nobody's gonna start a project like that without knowing what you're going to encounter. And so, and, yeah, and, and, and when th they along this is quite interesting because you said that once they found the great, uh, what'd you call it? I'm sorry, the great fissure, like uh, on the on the hips, the major like fissure, a major fissure, and they had to extend the body longer. They were kind of yeah. forced to include that test boring pit into the body of yeah. the like where the the butt is, the rump of the sphinx. Yeah, I find that's, that really that's my suggestion. Mm -hmm. So guess what? So when was the last time that was exposed to light? When they put the blocks on it so you could do luminescence dating mm -hmm. so you could date the sphinx now i don't know about luminescence dating because as far as i see every time i i haven't really investigated it but everyone everything i see says it has to be um um uh, quartz or felspar but somehow well, done, they did luminescence. They've done luminescence dating on the the granite in of the, the yeah, valley so granite temple would there. work yeah that would work but so since it's made out of limestone but they also did luminescence dating on some limestone hmm. so i i'm not that familiar with the technique or maybe there's maybe they've expanded it i i don't know but if it if it would work you could do that in fact all of the blocks all the phase one blocks but this would be a spot where you can get to you don't have to move a block you just have to you, you just have to open that up climb inside grab a sample <laughs> Submit it for analysis, and now you can date the construction of the Sphinx. Now, of course, Shock is going to say those blocks were put there. Those are repair blocks that were put there mm -hmm. by the the ancient Egyptians, and that's why you're going to get that date. But have you ever reached out to Shock? No, I haven't. I've, 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 I haven't. I should do that. I have not. I've, I've been mostly reaching out to Mark Laner. I met with him twice. Mm -hmm. I don't know what he makes of me. Um, when I met with Mark, first time was in Boston and the second time was in Cairo. And it was his first day there and my last day. And he actually said to me that Shock is right. That he is been oh, really? there. Yeah. <laughs> when was this? That he was there. Oh, it's about five years ago now. Wait so a second. When... <laughs> right on what? <laughs> on on well, the 12,000 years? He's, no, about the water erosion, that the water coming in, because he said he was there during a rainstorm and he saw the water enter the Sphinx enclosure just as shock as it described. And well, yeah, I but I like, mean, it doesn't imply that they were that it was erosion, you know, that it was caused from the precipitation and, and runoff of, from the, the surface level. It could have happened millions of years ago. And uh, conveniently, we have these little little canyons where the water falls down today running off the surface well, the sphinx, down into the, the the sphinx enclosure would have to be there but yeah he said he was right in terms of the water but i was just like and at that point i already i told him i said i was like how do i how do i address this how do how do i make this clear to him and i said there's very little erosion and in fact that was like the first time and it's again the great things that happen in a discussion when you're with other people because i, I concisely said for the first time there's very little erosion on the sphinx and I said, you know what we need to do is we need to get into the Sphinx enclosure and point to things and talk. <clears throat> so, but he was, I should have extended my stay, but at the same time, I just keep finding more evidence. And I finally feel like I've put together enough evidence because especially the, like I said, the thing that David Miano had me scratch my head over, <laughs> um, finally put it over where I'm like, okay, I, I, he said, so David has seen it. What I'm saying, and he said it's a very strong. He said it's a, you could consider it a very strong paper, so that's his mm. take on it. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm saying there's very little that erosion. Paper. I know. So I'm I've, a friend of mine at the university is reading it. He just read it on Wednesday, just yesterday. I gave it to him a couple weeks ago. He's a professor, not it, a totally different department, but he said, "Yeah, this is fascinating." Because I throw in, I let it just grow, and become mm. this major story. And he said, I'm not sure I'm reading why I'm reading this. But I said, but do you find it fascinating? He goes, yeah. Because so, mm. I do tie well, it all up at the end. 
<laughs> when when is the paper coming out by the way because uh, maybe after it comes out you can send it to some other geologists who have been uh you know joining in on the debate about the geology of the sphinx and then you guys can oh, i'd love that and have some back and forth i mean i know that like jim harrell uh, went back and forth with robert shock for some years i don't really know so much about his viewpoints on the sphinx but we did have a phone call with him and he seems like a really nice guy we had some email correspondences and uh, I mean, hey, maybe we should even have a four-way podcast with you and him, and we can talk about the I'm open. The, your differing views, where you agree <laughs> on things, where you might have, um, yeah, disagreements. But I'm curious, like, what other geologists would think of your work? I know Robert Schock, he's in his own category, but of all the other people who have weighed in on the Sphinx, I'm sure you guys would have a lot of interesting back like and forth ab about all the details. There's not a lot of geologists interested in it. It just isn't the case. There, I mean, so um, so to use an example, so I was just making some notes. So the the, the white sands footprints mm -hmm. in New Mexico. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that was uh, Jeff Baghetti, if I remember his name right. <clears throat> so he and I've got the woman that he works with. They um, they were the ones that dated those. And I met him <laughs> and I started talking to him about that. And then, oh no, I actually had a different paper. And then I, it was really, I was like, I looked at him and then I looked at the woman. I go, you guys were just on something. You did a video. And he goes, I guess it's out. They were on Nova just a few weeks before on the, on the episode on the White Sands. And I mentioned mm -hmm. my paper on the Sphinx and he said, oh, I saw that. And he said, that's you. He said, that was cool. <clears throat> and then he got into Randall Carlson and started talking about black mats. <laughs> And I'm like not familiar with that. So there's there's a ton of things that those guys will bring up that I have no fami familiarity with at all. Mm. And so, yeah, I mean, getting up, I, I can learn from anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've learned stuff from Land Randall Carlson. There's no question. And, and I said that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm having a debate or having a discussion is just this really great thing where you just suddenly become aware of something that you were unaware of before. And if you're open-minded, all of a sudden it changes anyways. Did, did we ever wrap up what you, what you thought the timeline of all this was? Yeah. So I'll, to wrap up. So the Sphinx is 4,500 years old, what everyone else. And now I'm, now I feel like I'm approaching what the alternative researchers are doing <laughs> is I'm saying everybody else who's ever looked at the Sphinx is wrong and that what they're calling erosion isn't erosion, that it's part of the construction process. And there's definitely some erosion <clears throat> that's occurring with the wicking water and there appears to be some erosion that was caused by windblown sand. We haven't gotten into that. But neither one of those can account for the degree of erosion that we're, we're seeing. And because that's imprinted on top like on the sidewall, it makes it look like that was the process that caused all of the erosion. And when you look at the Sphinx body itself, that's where it becomes more evident that what, what people have called erosion isn't erosion. Mm -hmm. So that's my conclusion. Everyone's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, so another, another question I've had is like, if there was this lost civilization using high technology, wouldn't there be signs such as like in uh, the ice cores of uh, the use of like melting um, different metals and or even like different things we'd find in the geological record that would indicate that people were melting metals and using high technology before we yeah. recognize so the, the, i mean the so that's that? that's boy that's a that's one of the tangents that randall carlson and graham hancock just love and that is is we nobody would know that we were here a million years from now or even a few thousand years from now is their conclusion and that is again completely wrong we are taking our debris sticking on us for a while and putting it into landfills and a lot of these landfills like are in desert areas and they're designed to not have water come in. So nothing's going to be degrading. And so you come here a million years from now, some of those landfills are still going to exist. And people will know you are here from that. And we've also 
created a carbon isotope excursion. So in the same way that we know that these hyperthermals have occurred in the past, people are going to see that we burned all the fossil fuels. Because when mm -hmm. photosynthesis occurs, it concentrates the carbon-12 isotope in the plant tissue. And if you were to burn that or the fuel, that releases excess carbon-12. And that goes into the atmosphere, and then that gets incorporated into shells like Pneumulites gizehensias and other organisms. And so you can take that and look at the carbon isotope ratios in that, and, and we would stand out. And there's other features. Yeah. So the thing mm -hmm. is, yes, if there were an advanced civilization in the past, so what Hancock is going to do is he's going to do what they do all the time, and they're going to say, as he did with Michael Shermer on Joe Rogan, Perhaps it was a monastery, and perhaps it was this, and perhaps it was... And he goes on for a while, to which the easy answer is, perhaps not. Because he hasn't presented a single piece of information to support any of those perhapses, so I don't have to present any information to counter mm -hmm. a perhaps. So no, there's the evidence would most likely be there. They're just simply saying that it's too small. One of the things is, is like Robert Schock, when he talks, he talks about the A-word, you can't use the A word around geologists because we're not ready. That's Atlantis. Uh, <laughs> it, he's, he can't use the A word around geologists because he can't defend it. That's the reality. If you, if you can come up and explain something, you can talk to anybody about it. But if you can't explain it, if you can't defend your view, and he can't and uses us as an example of what's wrong, maybe it's him mm -hmm. that's wrong. Mm -hmm. So, But if Atlantis did exist and it was a seafaring nation, well, then there'd be artifacts. There would be pieces of pottery. There would be sculptures. There would be things that have been taken to other places, and everyone would be scratching their head saying, where did this come from? And then they'd yeah. be looking for where it came from, and then they'd point back to Atlantis. Well, it's never happened, and it never will happen because it's not there. It's a dead issue. We, well, we would also find uh, <laughs> the 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 cross cultural um, sharing of like different domesticated plants and animals, but you don't find that in the ancient world. We find corn was only in certain, you know, in the Americas, and cacao, and tobacco, and potatoes, yeah. and tomatoes, and across the world they had wheat and all kinds of other stuff. If there was an advanced seafaring civilization thousands of years ago they would have been sharing these these crops back and forth and exactly and pigs and cows and all these different domesticated animals would have been shared too but we don't see any of that we don't see it in the genetics and, signals. and genetics yeah exactly yeah, and humans too and my parents you know they're so, both from europe and so my father's from hungary and so guess what they brought the peppers from hungary with them mm. you know when they immigrated because th nice. that, that, that's <laughs> precious to them that's that's not you're not going to leave that behind you just got to put a little bit of it in your pocket you have the best it Hungarian is... peppers or what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Nice. So, so this has been one thing that's been fascinating for me in starting our channel is we started full in the loss of trying to find evidence for a lost civilization and kind of follow our interest in Graham Hancock's work and all of that. But in in the process of making this channel, it's kind of forced us to do more research and kind of just how things naturally unfolded. We were led to like kind of discover that some of the things that we were learning were wrong. And in presenting our changing like perspectives, it's almost solidified or pushed me further into academia by how people have responded to that. It's like people think that we're now shills for big corporations or something. Like people honestly make comments saying that we're paid off to say what we say uh, because we disagree with uh, or have found evidence that uh, kind of contradicts what we learned in some of those books. And so for me, it's like, really t like an interesting exploration of human psychology to witness how we're just here trying to uncover this truth and be honest with our process and and not really kind of gloss over or around any of our kind of corners uh, so in doing that watching how people respond to that and how uh how we're kind of treated at, and and how the internet people behave on the internet as like really vile towards us for just wanting to uncover the truth has been a 
an interesting journey that has put for myself kind of made me trust less in those narratives <laughs> because of how uh, how emotional they are. Well, that's it exactly. So I have a question for you or for anybody who says this, because, yeah, I get the same thing, you know, Han and it's Hancock and those people that are encouraging that, that sort of behavior. And and I would ask, I'm an independent researcher. Where do I who do I talk to? Where's my money? I'm not hmm. I'm not working hey. at a university. So if this is happening, I could, I could go for some uh, <laughs> money like that. So who, do, who do I talk to? How do I get my back pay? Where is this coming from? Yeah. But what you also well, said something. I, ironically, that... <laughs> uh, a lot of the people who are promoting these, you know, alternative uh, theories, they're making tons of money on their tours and their YouTube oh, videos, and they're they're accusing, you know, the mainstream people of whatever guarding the what ancient secrets and telling lies <laughs> and making money. But they're actually sensationalizing these topics, and then once you sensationalize it to a point where it's become your your income, you know, you've got all this revenue flowing in from promoting and presenting this viewpoint. Essentially, you're not going to be looking for the truth anymore. You want to just continue down this avenue of presenting more and more evidence that just continues to support your ideas of an alternative view of history of this lost civilization. And it's kind of sad because then they're not actually looking for the truth as they claim. They're looking to just keep the gravy train flowing and try not to like, you know, get into any debates with people and just avoid talking about that and ignore this evidence and they keep their blinders on and they just want to stay in this one track. And I, I think that's really unfortunate because once you start looking beyond the little tunnel vision of that, you know, getting all your information from Graham Hancock wow. and people like that, once you get beyond that, you find a lot of really fascinating things that directly oh, challenge yeah. those views like <laughs> to the core they're they're catering to their audience rather than actually because i can say for our for our our perspective like it hasn't helped our subscriber yeah, numbers yeah. <laughs> and, and our support so like in doing this like we're kind of we had to make the choice of like do we be in integrity and follow where truth leads us or you know cater to the 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 choir so yeah. I'm going to tell you guys, when I watched your video, you, you asked me to watch the one that you did on the Scablands. <clears throat> I got to tell you, that was an amazingly well done video. I thought it was Thank one you. of the, we the best well presented, concise. I mean, you definitely are at that point still telling the Randall Carl Carlson version of it. Mm. But nonetheless, what you guys were presenting, I was like, you, you, you were a step above. <laughs> That's one of the reasons Thank why you. I was like, you guys are definitely, I have to compliment you on this. So I was thinking, I don't know if you're aware of this right now, but there's there's not many students that are going into geology. And um, are you hmm. familiar with Nick Zentner? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. yeah, he's doing that A to Z series. And he's the, 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 all of the schools, all the geology schools across the country are looking for students. You guys would make it. I mean, no, given given, I'm not interested. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have got the no, you you've got the curiosity, and you know how to approach it. You're approaching this as scientists, mm. and and I, I was really impressed by that. Thank you. you. Yeah, thank not, you. yeah, we put a lot of work into that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's well, the, so the, obvious. The interesting thing with the scablands too, it's like whether or not Randall's version is correct or not. Either way, the floods did happen there, and they were mm -hmm. of an enormous magnitude. And that's just incredibly fascinating, whether it was from a comet or from Lake Missoula, whether it was one flood or 90 floods or 71 floods or 40 floods. It doesn't really matter to me. I, I mostly, when we made that video, we wanted to show the story of where the water flowed and when it, how it went down. You look at the map and we tried to, you know, animate yeah. it with using Google Earth to show where all those tracks of water flowed and then converged and met into the... Um, uh, the Columbia River, and then flowed out to Portland, did, Oregon. Did you put I those mean, animations remarkable. together? Yeah, we yeah. made the whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> those were amazing. I learned from. I was like, okay, this is this is one of the best I've ever seen. Heck yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, thank you. It was a lot of work, man. I was actually I going onto onto Google Earth, and you can map out and draw like um, little sections and color it. So I was coloring it blue and tracing out and going along like the flood path and like drawing out and moving little dots and, and adding like many different uh, reference points. 
And then we would overlay that onto, like, uh, we'd take a photo of Google Earth and then turn on and off those layers and then, like, uh, you know, uh, f- fade them in directionally. So the water then would come yeah. into the screen. And it took forever because essentially we had to go through the Cheney Palouse Gablands tract and, like, Moses Cooley and Grand Cooley and, mm-hmm. and piece by piece try to map out as accurate as possible every part of where the Lake Lewis and Lake Condon and all of that, you know, piece together. But it, it was incredibly insightful for us because we'd always heard the story about all of these individual sites and coolies and different canyons and different regions. But I, I couldn't quite see in my mind how it all fit until we went on that tour with Randall. And then until we looked at it on Google Earth and saw, ah, okay, it came from here, it went down here, it met there, it separated, it converged, it, it, and then it went out into the ocean. And then I finally got the whole you know, bigger picture. And to me, that was the main point, at least for what I, how I wanted to make the video. Maybe we'll even make a follow-up video about that because um, whether or not Randall Carlson's version is correct or not isn't so important to me. I, I'm more interested in just yeah. what is the true version of of what happened. Yeah. But like just the geological story there is unbelievable. Every time I think about it, it, is. <laughs> it completely blows my mind. It's one of the most incredible sites that I've ever seen. I mean, it's many sites, but the whole the magnitude when you stand there and you look up at a thousand feet above you, there's a high water mark where water would have been flowing just full of icebergs and forests and rocks. And, and it went for hundreds of miles with just an yeah. unbelievable velocity and power and just ripping the earth apart and scouring. And uh, it's just, it's incredible. Like it's, it's one of the most remarkable places yeah. I've ever seen in the whole world. I'm still learning about the scab lands. I mean, I, I can, I know enough. I'm, I kind of focused myself in on how can I prove that they're wrong? But nonetheless, there's a story. And I thought when you did your video, when I watched it, I'm like, okay, now I understand some of this in a way Mm. that I haven't before. Again, Mm. because of those really cool animations. And I was going to make this suggestion that you just made, which is to do a follow-up and just, you just need to change some of the the text, you know, that you're saying to give a more concise. And if you want, you can, you know, others would say, you know, to, to just cover all your bases, but it's there. You did a great job. We... We, uh, we've actually been talking about, uh, you know, because we've changed our, our perspectives and like learned a lot since starting this channel, we now have videos, actually the majority of our videos, when we look back on them, we disagree with them. And so I've had the idea of like going back and like almost criticizing our own videos and like kind of watching our videos and picking them apart and saying why we're wrong and and how we're kind of presenting misinformation in some ways. Uh, one of the examples, and I think we're going to do this in the next week or so, is <laughs> take down our Sphinx video. Uh, we uh, have a, a video about the Sphinx where we uh, we kind of cover all of Robert Schock's kind of uh, findings. And we also present about uh, the Khafre statue and how it's like probably made by machine tools and stuff. And so... Um, and so there's just a lot, like when we look back at our previous videos, you know, the Scablands one being another video like that, uh, it's, and especially with producing these long documentaries like that, it's, we're bound to present a lot of things that are not necessarily as researched as we'd want. And so, uh, I'd like to kind of periodically kind of make videos where we pick apart our our previous videos yeah, we can take them down I, <laughs> or i'd leave them up because i don't think your journey is alone um mm. like i said i was surprised yeah. how many archaeologists have told me how they got into archaeology and then it relates to this sort of thing and <clears throat> and if if that's how people get into geology fine you know, you, you're going to go to a university and you won't, you won't last long. And you're going to go, oh, oh, I see it now. And, yeah. um, but no, so I think leaving the trail behind the, the path that you got here, instead of trying to make it seem like I knew that all along, I, I, I think yeah, you know, we've, we've all. That's a good point. It's, it's more, it's more like I, I just don't want to feed into these belief systems that are then coming back around to bite us in the ass of like, we we present this information sometimes people comment on those videos like the old sphinx and they're like oh yeah you're right graham hancock robert shock woohoo and i'm like damn actually we completely disagree with this now (laughs) and how do we what do we write in the description disclaimer 
we made this four years ago and now we <laughs> we don't agree with this. I mean, no one reads the descriptions, right? So like, do we leave it up? Do we delete it? I don't know. I've been kind of on the fence about that. So even in science on other things, you know, nothing, nothing as big as this, where you look at something in the past, like I kind of said that it was, it was nothing of any consequence, but I thought really not much has happened since the age of the dinosaurs. And I was very wrong. And I learned some amazing events in Earth's history in the past where I thought there was nothing of any interest. Mm -hmm. I know it's not a really good example, but there, there's, there's places where you, you know, scientists have thought one thing and then they realize later on, oh no, but that stuff's still out well, there. The Scablands, you know, I'm still, I still find Randall's coverage of it and what we learned from him, that is still the most plausible explanation to me. So let's me. go there. I, it's, let's go yeah, there. Yeah, let's go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I sent you, I'll, I'll start out with a bang then. <laughs> so I, I sent you the, the podcast thing with some slides and on yeah. Gobekli, I mean, on the, the Scablands. <clears throat> and there's one that just kills this idea before it even has any traction. If you guys want to hear Bob kill this idea, join us in part two of this podcast where we talk for two more hours on the Scablands, Gobekli Tepe, and a whole bunch of other cool stuff. Before you do so, please take a quick moment and hit that like button down below. It really does help us out a lot, so thank you very much. And the link to our Patreon is also in the description if you want to help us that way. Thank you so much for watching and choosing to spend your time with us, and we'll see you in part two.